Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is John Caritas, and I'm here in my capacity as chair of the New Zealand Grasslands Trust. I want to welcome you to the Ray Brown Trophy winner presentation, which this year uh, will be in the format of an interview. Uh, this is an innovation driven primarily by the COVID-19 issue, and who knows, it may be an option for the future. Uh, we will be guided uh, by your feedback on that. So each year, the New Zealand Grasslands Trust awards the Rybrown Trophy to a person associated with the pastoral farming industries who has made an outstanding national contribution over their working career. This was instituted in the memory of Dr. Ray Brown, director of DSIR Grasslands from 1970 to 1985. The Trust website, which you can find on the Grasslands Association website, now holds a biography of Ray written by Warwick Harris, and I would encourage you to look at this. In 2019, the Bray Brown Trophy was awarded to Gavin Sheath. Gavin Sheath is recognized for his work on pasture management and sustainable farming systems for over 40 years. His research career started at Invermay as a district scientist for math technology before moving to Whatapwata Research Centre in 1978 and then AgriSearch through until 2011. He then moved into private consultancy. Gavin's involvement in the New Zealand Grass Grassland Association has been second to none. He has published more than 30 NZGA conference papers and was on the NZGA executive for a decade, resulting in being the president in 1985. He was a New Zealand Grassland Trust trustee for 33 years from 1985 through to 2018 and was chair of the trust for three years from 2013 to 17. For his services to the association, Gavin was made an honorary life member in 2011, oh, sorry, 2001. Gavin, we're looking forward to hearing from the lessons you have learned from your 40 or more years of involvement in agricultural research and practice change on farm. So I'm now going to hand over to Liz Wedderburn, who will take us to the interview. Liz. Thank you very much, John. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, we're really delighted that we've been able to pick up this innovation and have this conversation with Gavin. My name is Liz Wedderburn. I'm the Assistant Research Director at Ag Research. But more importantly, um, I've been a colleague and friend of Gavin since 1985. And even although we talk about this as an innovation, it also came about through a few bottles of red wine. And we managed to persuade Gavin to move into the tech age. Now we're going to um, have a bit of a conversation that's going to cover about six topic areas. And you've got the ability to ask questions throughout the conversation. When you look at your um, live stream, there's an area there which allows you to um, pose a question and we'll be collecting those as we go on. So uh, look forward to that over the next hour. So Gavin, we're here all these months. The uh, Ray Prome is a really interesting character. I read the biography. What was what did he mean to you? Um, I suppose you could sum up the he's a cantankerous bugger. Oh, like you then, yeah. Um, <laughs> but in terms of uh, uh, working together with uh, him through International Grasslands Conference mm -hmm. and uh, offshore work, we become quite close working colleagues and mates. Um, but I suppose to uh, kind of think of him and what I regard him for is the way he and uh, so the late Arnold Bryant mm -hmm. actually took science out to the farm community and to the rural professionals that support uh, the farmers. So that, that's uh, something quite special to me about Ray. Yeah. Yeah. Really lovely. So the, you're a young man brought up in Kuro, where the back blocks there. What on earth motivated you to take up a science career? Mm. Uh, I suppose I developed an affinity for rural people, farming people, by rousing on the shearing shed for dad. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in going to Lincoln, 
college at that stage, what is what it was called. It was actually um, Jim White that mm, yeah. uh, on one occasion took me as an undergrad to a New Zealand Grasslands Association conference. And I thought, oh, that's something that I wouldn't mind doing. Uh, mm. And then the kind of um, listening to people like Paul Gregg and Terry Ludeka about field research, I thought uh, by the mm. time I finished uh, that study, it was something that I wanted to do. And um, as John mentioned, uh, my first employment was as a district scientist uh, mm. at Invermay. But we weren't, uh, being a district scientist, you had to do all your work on farmers' property. Mm. So, that, that meant, uh, and that was in the central of North Otago areas, mm -hmm. uh, so it meant that I got quite close to working with uh, farm advisors and farmers and doing trials on farm, and mm -hmm. I suppose that developed my kind of uh, commitment, if you like, to, mm -hmm. to, um, to uh, contribute to the well-being of, uh, of farmers, and, and uh, science was a good way of being able to do that. Oh, pretty cool. The career evolving because you've done a lot of different things, um, very diverse. So tell us a little bit about how your career sort of evolved over the years. Yeah, well, um, from that work that uh, we were doing in the Otago area, I went through to Messi uh, University and did uh, my doctorate there mm -hmm. uh, with Graham Motkin, and that was uh, an interesting experience. What it did, it actually gave me the opportunity to uh, really dig into the literature, mm -hmm. uh, and I did a kind of a, an agro uh, physiology study um, with uh, Lotus pedunculatus. But the thing that struck me when doing that was a lot of the literature never really led to a, a kind of an applied outcome. Mm -hmm. And when I'd finished that uh, particular three years there, I did think that I, what I really wanted to do was be an applied agricultural researcher. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and shifted through to Fadafada, mm -hmm. which at that time was um, uh, kind of being established to provide R&D support to the North Island hill country farming mm -hmm. people. And I um, was involved there uh, in the area of pasture management, uh, legume research uh, in those early years at Fadafada. The interesting thing I can remember so vividly though, was sitting on a hillside and um, I was waxing lyrical about all the knowledge I had of uh, grazing management on legume composition, pasture productivity, etc. And this uh, farmer kind of said to me amongst the group, he said, uh, well, it's pretty knowledgeable, Gavin, but so what? And it set me right on my backside because I didn't have an answer to him really uh, in terms of what at a farm level, uh, these practices would actually really mean uh, it was kind of good component work. And yeah. at that stage is when I thought I'd like to actually get into farm systems mm -hmm. type of, of work here. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's led us into the farm systems domain. Yeah. That is, the systems domain is really interesting because I think over the last 12, 15 months, I've seen a resurgence of everybody talking about systems. So, you know, what do you mean by a systems approach? And to help us, Jenna, could we have this slide number one? Thank you. Uh, well, I kind of look at when I'm explaining to people about farm systems and a farm systems approach, I kind of look at it a bit like a, an onion. Mm -hmm. And in the kind of centre rings of the onion, I'd see that the boundary is the farm business. Uh, so in the first instance, around a farm systems approach is defining the boundary. Mm -hmm. And uh, inside that boundary, I see that there's all the biophysical components of you know, plants and soils and animals. Uh, most importantly, though, the people mm -hmm. in the centre of because they will, uh, to me, uh, become a really important part of farm systems. Uh, so it's knowing that boundary and then understanding, if you like, um, what the what the reaction is of that system to uh, some kind of prompt, whether it's a policy or it's in fact um, an innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, how does the farm system behave and in which way does it actually move uh, its resilience, what's its stability, 
those are the things that I, I kind of have in my mind when I talk about farm systems. So it's quite theoretical when you talk like that. And I know there are quite a number of younger researchers who are struggling with, it yeah, sounds great, but how do you actually implement it? So just could you describe about how you implement a systems approach? Give us an example of how that yeah. might work. Well, probably Liz, it'll be, uh, I might just explain, I suppose, the way that we went about actually um, evolving, mm -hmm. if you like, an approach. Uh, in the, I uh, suppose it would be the mid 80, 1980s, um, there would be people such as Rex Webby uh, and Chris Boom and myself mm -hmm. uh, looking at taking component work and in the field, field experiments at a systems level, uh, farmlet studies, mm -hmm. looking to see what the consequences were of different types of grazing management or different um, pasture improvement methodologies, etc. So. In the first stage, it was, I suppose, very much like um, the traditional farm, farm systems field work. Mm -hmm. The thing that's interesting, though, if I think back to it, was that the questions that were then posed to us were, um, but in my area, the results might be a bit different. Yeah. And at that stage, uh, people such as David McCall and Paul Marshall were mm -hmm. developing up uh, a farm systems model called Stockpile, mm -hmm. and that's now become the core, if you like, now of the farm mix products. But those uh, models and tools were really helpful to actually do scenarios that might be more relevant to other regions of the North Island, mm -hmm. in terms of whether it's the pasture growth patterns or the type of livestock systems that are there. Mm -hmm. So modelling become part of mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the systems approach. The thing that was really frustrating though, is that you'd have this kind of information evidence and you'd still be talking with farmers and farmer groups and they'd say, oh yeah, but I'm not certain whether it's relevant to us. Yeah. And at that stage, um, uh, we started working with people like Bob Thompson oh, up yeah, in Northwood yeah, yeah. and went about the business of um, putting the practices in place on farm and intensively monitoring the performance of it mm -hmm. and basically then having evidence available to the groups of farmers that would be working with it uh, as to what the implications actually are of the practices in the area. Mm -hmm. So that became what we called farm monitoring or mm -hmm. subsequently study groups if you like. Yeah. Uh, but the one thing that came out of that was recognising just the importance of, if you like, farmers uh, influencing other farmers, mm -hmm. evidence from farmers themselves being quite important in the change. And it struck me then that um, that the people side of uh, the systems yeah. is actually a really, really key part that we were not paying enough attention to. Mm -hmm. And at that stage, um, Kerry Parmenter mm -hmm. uh, and then Mark Payne came in to the teams and started working around the whole domain of decision making mm -hmm. farmer actions to help actually complement that circle, uh, mm -hmm. inner circle that I was referring to before mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the systems approach. So that was kind of a bit of a story about yeah. the way we uh, attacked it. Mm -hmm. um, it was an evolutionary process, mm -hmm. but in the end, I now look back and see that actually what we put up in that diagram kind of captures it. Yeah. Perfect. It's a really nice diagram to, to it's a nice simple one. I like it. I like it. Um, again, thinking about some of our, our younger, less experienced people who want to get into systems, uh, what are the characteristics you need to, to be a systems researcher or to just Think, you don't need to be a researcher, but to think in a systems way, what are the characteristics of a person? Uh, my view would be that they need to be looking outwards. Uh, mm -hmm. They need to be focusing their minds on outcomes, the outcomes that mm -hmm. are being sought. Um, so that's a really kind of key, uh, I suppose, a key thing. But I think the other most important thing is that um, uh, to be interested in other disciplines. Mm -hmm is uh, really, really important to actually understand what other knowledge systems, knowledge sets, other disciplines offer mm -hmm. uh, to the system solution. 
um, and to, uh, I suppose, to learn the language, if you mm -hmm. like, of other disciplines and be respectful of them. Mm -hmm. Do they have to be science disciplines? Could it be art? Could it be music? Could uh, it be literature? What, 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 what do you mean by different knowledge systems? Yes, it could well be that. Mm -hmm. It could well be that. And again, um, one of the things that I certainly feel quite strongly is the listening to practical experience mm -hmm. and interpreting what that might mean as well. Um, so therefore, farmers themselves and professionals, rural professionals have got a lot to offer in the kind of systems thinking. But mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe to add to your question, and mm -hmm. it's just a little bit more I want to say is that it does maybe centre around individuals to some extent. But a systems approach is pretty highly dependent on actually teams yeah. and the ability to put teams together with the correct kind of disciplines, work through the issues. They may then disband, uh, but drawing in, if you like, different disciplines, depending on the outcome you're mm -hmm. seeking. And it's a, a systems approach. It's very much a team's approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's really that's helpful. Yeah. I'm going to move on to a, um, a section around about the people. So, you, you, you know, you talk about the farmer, the decision maker being centric. Um, why do you think the people and the practice uh, is so important? Well, yeah. uh, I suppose the thing that I, I see it is that, uh, particularly in a research mode, is if you do research and you've got outputs that are of some significance and value and then mm -hmm. they are not actually taken up, by the farming community or by businesses that might serve as a farming community. You've then got to ask the re why was the research undertaken mm -hmm. and why was investment made? So simply ending up with work being put in a science paper, from my perspective, was not adequate. Mm -hmm. It's part of a rigorous science approach, but to actually get the changes occurring in the businesses was to me the most important thing in the outcomes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And people are the decision the decision makers. Yeah. The um, why have you been such a strong advocate for the farmer to farmer learning? Well, um, with I think Gina, you may have put up um, the slide too, and this is a, a Gavin sheet, uh, if you like, kind of. Uh, interpretation of what's gone on when I think of the practices we've been involved in and the type of work that the social research folk have been able to inform us with. But we seem to be able to put, uh, and we do put a lot of time into the awareness area and mm -hmm. create awareness about the change that's required. It's just our advertising kind of think mode. Um, we then go through the process of thinking that if Farmers, say for instance, are more knowledgeable, they have more skills, then that in itself, along with awareness, then change will occur. Well, mm. that isn't the case. Yeah. Uh, and um, we recognise that people need to be motivated to change, and that can be mm. voluntary or it could be regulatory. Uh, so, you know, what's the cost benefits of not changing? And so those things are in place. But the one thing I've um, come to recognise, certainly within the farming community, but maybe with most people, actually, particularly adults, mm -hmm. it's this area of confidence to change is yeah. actually the real constraint as to why things move or don't move. Um, and to my mind, uh, it is farmers um, learning from other farmers, uh, seeing new practices in place, mm -hmm. having confidence that they understand the risks and the benefits. And that's why I'm being quite a champion, if you like, of mm. farmer to farmer learning. And uh, I do think that, um, well, the most recent example of where I feel this is being put in place really well mm. is with the deer industry. Yeah. And they have um, put in place what's called advanced parties. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's all about, is trying to give confidence to farmers um, uh, that uh, the changes are going to be of benefit to them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We've had a, a question from the audience about, can you give us a brief reflection on, I guess, the value of the Ruakura and the Farafara farmer field days? Uh, yeah. Well, in this diagram that you have here, where did, where did they sit? Yeah, yeah. 
Well, I would have still seen that those field days were very much about creating an awareness uh, of the importance and mm -hmm. providing a little bit of evidence mm -hmm. that might improve the knowledge of the people in attendance. Mm -hmm. um, what I would think, though, is that the connections that were often made at those particular events mm -hmm. uh, were then on flowing, and so it would be more when the relationships between, say, some of the applied researchers and the farming community, rural professionals, mm -hmm. actually occurred subsequent. And so it was about an engagement. I would have said mm -hmm. that one of the key things that came from those field days was an engagement and that researchers really aren't funny buggers after all. Uh, they're actually well, some, yeah, ordinary some. people that have got <laughs> something they can offer. Yeah. Yeah. So and another question we've had from the audience too is how do you convince farmers to participate in research? So you did a lot of the farmlets, you were out there, you were on farms, but why did they decide to work with you? Uh, good question. Um, I suppose um, you might uh, you might still have to look at the connections that we as researchers had within those communities. So mm -hmm. a lot of the time we would be well connected and engaged with those rural professionals mm -hmm. and they were very good working partners to be working with to draw together actually um, community groups or study groups. Mm -hmm. uh, so our connections uh, with those people or more uh, recently with the uh, um, processing companies, mm -hmm. uh, whether that be meat or dairy processing companies, them being also a good linking kind of conduit to mm -hmm. the science. And I think that's been something that's been really important is that it's uh, not a science to farmer mm -hmm. relationship, it's actually a science to business, rural professionals or business to farmers, and they, they, those were some mm. strong parts, yeah. good partners that yeah. have been in there. Yeah. There's been a lot of talk more recently and a lot of uh, thinking about um, a national extension service. What's your view on that? Do you think that would accelerate change? No. No? Why not? Uh, yeah, this might annoy a few folks. I, I kind of see, um, if I look back and think about it, is a national kind of extension service. Historically, uh, those entities become, if you like, the agents for policy. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, they are, I, I caution, I caution that in the sense that they simply then start to be the promoter and agent, if you like, of mm -hmm. policy changes. That uh, central or local government might want. I would much prefer to see um, a strong rural professional body. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there will be also people sitting inside uh, some of the other organisations uh, that um, can actually, uh, I think, embrace some of the things we've just been talking mm -hmm. about in terms of what's important to actually um, um, get change practice underway mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I don't think a national um, extension service would do that. Mm -hmm. To my mind extension is too much about I'll tell you, mm -hmm. I've got something to tell you rather than actually working with people to understand what they know and how to mould their pra current practices mm -hmm. into a, a, a better way of doing things mm -hmm. in the future. Often I hear you know, farmers need to change, but, you know, the practice, but really, you know, from your perspective, who actually needs to change? What practices need to change? Because it's not just farmers. Correct. And I possibly was indicating that in my, just terms of my answer earlier, yeah. which was, I think that um, uh, there is certainly a need for, um, uh, you can go right through from people who set policy uh, through to people who are providing services to farmers. Um, I'd also be in the in terms of the sector bodies, mm -hmm. um, recognising, uh, if you like, uh, the importance of the people component mm -hmm. um, and the way in which people decide and act. Yeah. I think that needs to be much more evident 
in uh, the way that all of those organisations along that chain mm -hmm. operate. Yeah. yeah. We've got another question from the audience is about what's your big regret? Oh, can't even read that. What is your big regret and adoption failure? Uh, people continuing to word use extension. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because again, as I say, uh, it's trying to break that mould of um, uh, people just uh, think, well, I've got knowledge, I've got information, and here you are, mm -hmm. and isn't this use good it, for you? Yeah, use it, use it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, that, to me, we still have still got a lot of that. Uh, probably the other biggest regret, and again, um, the IT type people won't particularly <laughs> like me, but um, it's this issue of we'll put all of this down on a piece of paper and we will provide that information to you and of course you now will be able to do things. Um, the worst thing that's happened is that then go and put this piece of paper on some form of online medium mm -hmm. and expect that actually everyone will read it on a computer and simply that that now will create change. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to me, that's just lazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just lazy in terms of um, simply I've now passed over my knowledge to you and if you don't actually take it up any further mm -hmm. then it's your problem. I don't think that's been, uh, that's not um, adequate. Mm -hmm. Interesting question that was. It was, thank yeah. you. Uh, we're going to move on to, you've, you've talked a lot about relationships, you know, your relationships with Ray, relationships with the sector. Um, and, you know, I'm laughing because half the time you're offshore. Yeah, you know? yeah where's Gavin? Ah, oh, Japan, you know, Colombia, somewhere exotic. So what I'm, and, and often I hear from people that, you know, what are you going offshore for and telling them their ideas? So tell me what you, what did you learn from all your lovely international travels and experience? Uh, Probably that New Zealand agriculturists are arrogant. Uh, we think we're the best farmers in the world. Uh, there's a whole lot of other reasons why we actually perform fairly well. It's not mm -hmm. just uh, us as people. Um, and so what I'm meaning by that is that uh, some of the very early lessons I learned going offshore mm -hmm. was to um, get to understand the context. Uh, first and foremost, and then once you knew the context in which farmers were working offshore, uh, then you could propose the principles that were in your mind and see how they might actually be adapted mm -hmm. uh, to their circumstances. And I, I can remember one of the very wake-up calls I had was in China, mm -hmm. and I'd spent a couple of visits trying to convince some of the people in the communes that the genetics of the pigs they had there were poor. Mm -hmm. because they lay down a large amount of fat and very little lean muscle. And it wasn't until at some stage after maybe the third visit uh, that I was actually informed that that the actual fat, that lard, was actually more precious than the meat because that made the soaps and the mm -hmm. wax for the candles and everything mm -hmm. else. And I felt such a bloody idiot um, <laughs> because I didn't understand actually um, the context. context. Yeah. And so, yeah, those that was a very important learning. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And what did you bring back from overseas that would have benefited New Zealand, do you mm. think? Uh, it answers a little bit to where you were before. Mm -hmm. um, I do recognise probably now that we were basically, and there's several, uh, a number of us were working offshore through the 80s, 90s. Mm -hmm. So we were involved, I think, in agricultural diplomacy. Yeah. And I do think that that's been an important part to the kind of relationships that exist mm -hmm. between New Zealand and other countries, whether that be in South America yeah. uh, or in Asia. Um, so that would be one part of it. The, the second, though, is, is an example. Uh, some early work that uh, I did in France with sheep, uh, French sheep farmers. Mm -hmm. Uh, to understand the value of Appalachian branding mm -hmm. and provenance and uh, bringing that back into New Zealand. And so I kind of think that some of the principles that we put into producer clubs within the meat industry, mm -hmm. uh, particularly along with Canterbury Meat Packers and ANSCO, 
the Waitrose program, mm -hmm. uh, but possibly the one that I hold most dearly mm -hmm. is what we refer to as the Elf Natural Beef program mm -hmm. that yeah. was started in the year 2000 and still going, mm -hmm. uh, which again has a, uh, a proprietary branded type of uh, structure mm -hmm. to it. Um, and uh, farmers specifically linked into specs of the fact that the uh, the um, restaurant chain requires up in Japan. So um, that was some of the things. One, you know, an example of what mm -hmm. I was able to bring back in from seeing what happened with the French uh, Appalachian uh, mm -hmm. sheep farms. Yeah. yeah. So were you doing research or were you doing development, and what's the difference? Oh, I think for the majority of the work that we were doing, I'm sure it was all development work. Mm -hmm, yep, mm -hmm, yep, yep, absolutely. Yep. Um, developing out new practices or solutions within their context. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what did that mean when you came back and started thinking about oh, looking at Māori development? How, how did it influence your um, interest in Māori agribusiness? Uh, yeah, well, I have to be able to um, from a personal point of view, I can remember being lined up by my wife, Megan, one day. Said, Good lady. She said, um, why are you going offshore and helping all these other people when you could be helping our people back home in New Zealand mm. uh, in our Maori businesses? And I kind of, oh, that's a good challenge. Mm. Uh, so, you know, that um, along with 30 people such as uh, Richard Fox and Bob Cottrell, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, they were quite important people to start the linkage between um, the research that we were doing, the science we had, and Maori agribusiness. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think if I was giving any advice to people, I was based again on um, on the experiences. Is that again? It's just as I said before, is not turning up and saying, "Hey, look." I've got a solution here, but understanding the context in which Maori businesses are operating, mm -hmm. uh, the importance, the cultural importance of their land and water mm -hmm. uh, to to them, uh, to the issues around intergenerational um, exchange of uh, of uh, whenua, mm -hmm. uh, these are really quite important things to understand, and um, going to the Marae and taking the time to actually listen and build up a sincere relationship, I think is particularly important mm -hmm. uh, in being able to contribute to uh, the development of Maori agribusiness. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, there's people like uh, Kingy Smiler, who I have mm -hmm. a high regard for um, encouraging ongoing innovation that will be of assistance to, um, to Maori uh, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've got a question from the audience. Um, what's the most impactful research you've seen and why do you think it's been so impactful? That's interesting. Mm. <laughs> I would have to think that uh, it's probably been in the, yeah, it's interesting. The several. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Yeah. But I think that the early work that was done in genetics, animal mm -hmm. genetics, uh, through the 70s, 80s, uh, provided us with a great resource to really drive flock performance in the 90s and 2000s mm -hmm. um, would be one area. Um, uh, the area of endophytes mm -hmm. uh, and um, the relationship to uh, persistence of uh, our pastoral plants and the kind of removal, if you like, of ryegrass staggers as a mm. disease was another important, I think, um, innovation. And um, certainly uh, electric fencing mm -hmm. uh, has been one other that I would see has come through and has made a whole lot of practice uh, that we have quite possible. Mm. Those are three things that come to mind across the spectrum. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Ah, now I think you and I, as we know, are probably on quite different political spectrums. Say that, you may say that, I can possibly comment. But what I'm really interested in is science and politics. And, you know, we've chatted about this a lot. So what do you mean that science is political? 
It's independent. It can't possibly be political, Gavin. It sure as hell is political. So right? tell me, what do you mean? Tell all these people out there, what do you mean? Yeah, well, I think if I get track back, um, and it's in my time while I've been in science. So yeah. came to Fata Fata under the kind of um, directions of the Muldoon policies, which was to develop hill country, to grow our sheep flock and uh, so forth. So uh, late 70s, early 80s, we were involved in land development, cutting trees down, um, increasing the, the flock, sowing out pastures, etc. To my embarrassment now to find that actually we're now putting trees back on mm -hmm. to some of the land that that policy at the time and our science yeah. encouraged. So then we'd track on through and it was the 80s when we went into diversification and it was llamas, alpacas, Awasi sheep, whatever you like, are going to be the saviour. And again, my association with that was in the goat fibre area. Yeah. And uh, that um, was going to be a saviour for many people. But again, we forgot all about the marketing aspects of yeah. it. And it had a, a very vulnerable value chain, supply chain arrangement. Uh, global biotechnology. So we go to the late 90s. So everything is to be biotechnological. And, and that's where a lot of agricultural research suffered, uh, I would mm. say, in terms of investment. Um, and it wasn't until about 2005 there's a realisation that you actually had to link biotechnology innovations into some of our sectors and existing mm. value chains if it was going to be of any good. And our current kind of um, if you like, political uh, kind of emphasis is now on environment. And uh, yes, we are wanting to clean up our waterways, but one other area that I'm most concerned about at the moment is the policy around forestation and mm -hmm. the targets in terms of the number of trees. And I'd just love to take people up north of Gisborne, mm -hmm. round through to Apotiki, and you can have a look at the disastrous consequences on rural communities mm -hmm. Uh, that actually sit in that area when we go into uh, a forestry regime. Mm. Now, why I'm raising is those kind of, and I'm not that naive to recognise that if you're looking for government investment, then investments go down the policy lines. But what I'm most anxious about is the lack of analysis that's done in terms of the unintended consequences. Yeah. And so with a singular focus on a particular policy, a whole lot of unintended consequences emerge and they bite your bum in the end. Mm -hmm. And this is probably where I'd like to see science and particularly systems research be a lot more effective in helping inform policy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as I say, yeah, I don't need to be, don't want to be naive about it, but mm -hmm. I do think that um, we need to attend to the unintended consequences a lot more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, an example right at the moment is, again, in the areas of improving our waters and fresh water. Um, I think there's been quite inadequate socioeconomic analyses mm -hmm. that have actually been done when policies have been looked at and set. Uh, it's been strongly biophysical mm -hmm. uh, in the thinking that's gone on. Mm -hmm. So where do you think or how do you think then that science can support policy in this sort of post-truth world where and science is kind of dist, what, what is the role then? Yeah, uh, well, possibly as I said before, I'm, I'm of the view that science uh, can and should be actually informing uh, policy. Mm -hmm. So it's a, um, what I do get quite anxious about though is when science or scientists become an advocate for a particular mm. policy or cause. And I do caution people on saying, when you start moving from a science position to an advocate's position, you're on dangerous ground mm -hmm. uh, because that leads then to the uh, mistrust mm -hmm. uh, of your independence uh, and where you're standing. I mm -hmm. think that's quite an important uh, uh, caution I'd make to people when they are dealing with policy. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of still look back and think, you know, again, making some uh, mistakes in my own life. Is no. that, yeah, you know, can't stand up on a soapbox and sprout forth as to what actually should be yeah. happening. 
because, um, and, and I think of way back, you know, must be in the mid 90s. Uh, you, along with myself and a couple of other folk, started talking about environmental issues mm -hmm. in our farming system, but we did it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. We were not talking and spending time with the correct influences of policy. Mm -hmm. I think we were too much up the front uh, on the soapbox. Mm -hmm. Interesting point. Uh, oh, a question from the audience is, um, what do you think the work at Furafara tells us about best land use, food production and carbon deforestation? Because that was really, we, there was a lot of work done there on the, on those topics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it is interesting that uh, while um, the majority of the work we did at Furafara was in the livestock pastoral area, um, there was, and I probably again thinking it was around about the mid 1990s, a decision that we made uh, to actually take some of the land out and put it into different type of uh, timber trees. Mm -hmm. uh, one block into pine um, and other blocks uh, in terms of around remnant natives uh, into indigenous. Mm -hmm. And actually sitting out there at the moment is a, a wonderful case study. Mm -hmm. And I give total credit to people such as Bruce Thorold and Terry Palmer and mm -hmm. Mike Dodd for that type of work that's mm -hmm. there. Um, the one thing, and that was recognising that there is actually different, uh, feel like microclimates, different um, land use soil um, suitability, land use suitability uh, that's uh, sitting in the mosaic and the variation within hill yeah. blocks. The one thing that we probably didn't give uh, thought to, but if one was doing it now, is where does horticulture fit within mm. some of those mm. unique microclimates and, and very good soils that might sit there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. One of the things that I think is really important for, for researchers looking forward is as these political agendas change, then the expectation is you drop your capability and you pick up another capability. Uh, so, what's what's your advice to people? How do you how do you prepare yourself for a career that you mm. is going to be ducking and diving around mm. different challenges that mm. the investors find important? Yeah. Um, if uh, if I look back, I think of the people who I'd say have been good researchers. It is their skill sets to actually undertake robust research, mm -hmm. setting a hypothesis, setting a clear objective. What is the what is the problem to be actually solved? Mm -hmm. um, working through then, in fact, the actual rigor of good experimentation, um, and then um, the challenge of publishing and having your peers uh, actually um, critique your work. Mm -hmm. of, to me, is the key. And if those are skill sets, there I've seen that people can quickly learn a new subject area. Mm -hmm. And um, if you are, I feel, if you're a good researcher, you're a keen learner, mm -hmm. and it doesn't take too long for you to pick up actually another subject area and utilise the same underlying skills mm -hmm. that actually you were trained with. And I think that that's something that organisations can play a big role in, yeah. in helping people as they go through the different kind of um, challenges that uh, put in front of them to uh, allow people to, um, it's not mm -hmm. upskill, it's actually mm -hmm. to get a new fresh set of knowledge mm -hmm. and uh, and attack that that mm -hmm. way, yeah, mm -hmm. gives adaptability. Great, great. Um, we're going to move to slide three now, thanks Jenna, because we're, we're going to look a little bit to the future. And so, um, Gavin, again, you know, in your opinion, what are the future challenges? Yeah, well, in part, uh, you um, might have been posing uh, one of the questions earlier to the first point I've put okay. up here on the slide. Uh, but it, it is this issue of ensuring that um, as we work through and deal with the environmental challenges there, that we actually take into account and get the right balance mm -hmm. between um, the social and the economic well-being of people. And I suppose the thing that's, that's there is these are going to be complex yes. uh, issues that sit there with multiple kind of tensions sitting in there. 
Um, and that's where I do see that a systems approach is going to be particularly uh, important. Uh, but um, getting a stronger socioeconomic component into our systems, thinking in the change that people are asking, to my mind, is going to be important. Mm -hmm. um, the issue of uh, ensuring that future land use uh, actually fits the purpose. Um, the questioner that was asked around Fatafata probably uh, partly answered it. Mm -hmm. But one thing I've noted, and it's by my kind of visitation to the East Coast, and the and I'm now moving a little bit into the horticulture side of things, but as we intensify the land use on lands that are actually more suitable mm -hmm. for intensive use, um, I think that it's going to be particularly important also to deal with the infrastructural needs, mm -hmm. and so therefore the ability to get product to market, and the actual social or people resources. So to attract people into these areas for more intensive land use operations, yeah. there's going to have to be better schooling. Yeah. There's going to have to be better services. So just an investment into the biophysical kind of side of things is not going to be adequate mm -hmm. going forward if we want to rejuvenate the rural communities. Okay. Um, infrastructure and uh, social services are important. And uh, the third um, thought that I had about the future challenge that you put to me is um, this the whole area of gene editing. Mm -hmm. Now, I know we've gone through the machinations of GMOs and so forth. There's a current view that we need to be in natural products. But I do think that the generations of the 2050s, 2060s will look back at us as being too weak mm -hmm. and not actually going about the business of um, exploring the opportunities in plants, mm -hmm. uh, in an animal, uh, in terms of gene editing. And you might chuckle at this, but there's a kind of a fashionable word at the moment called regenerative agriculture. It could well be that gene edited plants or animals are a key part mm -hmm. to a sustainable regenerative system in 50 years time. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got to remember that the animals, the plants that we've got now in our farming are nothing like the so-called natural plants which they were developed from about 200 years ago. So it's all about evolution, and I think gene editing's got a fairly major role to play mm. going forward. So uh, can we go to slide four? Thanks, Jenna, because um, really what's needed to address these challenges? Yeah, yeah. Well, in the sense uh, I put uh, my first thought to that question, Liz, was um, science has done a really good job. In the past. I'm pleased. I'm pleased. I have good. that view. Good. Um, uh, and we should celebrate it when we can um, and um, let people know that actually it does contribute uh, well to the innovations that are going forward. So that's something I think we need to do. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I do, though, worry that there is, in fact, too much distance between, um, if you like, the uh, sectors, the pastoral sector uh, bodies mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and uh, R&D. And that, I think, can go right back to that global biotechnology type mm -hmm. of era of the early 2000s. And there is, to my mind, a very important um, engagement required between those who lead R&D and those who are actually in the sectors in terms of whether they're business people or setting uh, sector policies mm -hmm. to get, in fact, more trust into what R&D can offer. Uh, so those two kind of link yeah. to some extent. Um, and while I've always kind of harped on about the applied side and the farm side mm. of, of um, you know, agricultural R&D, I do recognise that it's still extremely important to generate new knowledge from basic yeah. work. Um, the areas, if you were going to ask me uh, what I, where I think we need more knowledge on, uh, um, certainly soil biota. Mm. I, uh, I do think we uh, really shorten the knowledge of the biota in our soils. And that in part has a little bit uh, to play in that regenerative ag. Mm -hmm. uh, my experience of working in Asia, particularly Japan, they are much, much more knowledgeable about soil biota than us. We're weak there. Um, but there would be other areas as well. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, I think probably um, we will need to deal with a lot of the complex systems going forward. We will need a systems approach, as we've described before. Um, and uh, that, I would feel, uh, would be uh, really well supported if we could draw a lot of our land-based research and education institutions mm -hmm. together. Uh, I've kind of historically always felt that the land grant colleges in the States were mm -hmm. quite a good model, but the very best model I can think of as to where I would love to see New Zealand mm -hmm. R&D in this area is Wageningen yeah. in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. uh, I've visited there on many occasions since the 80s, mm -hmm. and uh, I still hold it in high regard in the way they've been able to integrate things in terms of learning and research uh, different disciplines coming mm. together, uh, it's a good model. And my final point, I suppose, about what's needed is um, we've just got to keep trying to uh, attract, grow, enthuse the young weak people who mm. want to come into research because they are they actually are the future. Uh, and we just can't actually see them as just a production unit. Yeah. I don't know if you follow what I mean by that. Uh, bringing them in and caring and nurturing because I do look back and I do look back at some of the people that were really important to me uh, in terms of mentoring me. Um, as I said right early on, Jim White, mm -hmm. um, I have the highest regard for Bill Kane and his mm -hmm. mentoring of me. To, mm -hmm. she, she used to say to me, have a go. If you think that's the way to go, have a go. Mm -hmm. And so I think that gives you the confidence to, mm -hmm. to do that. So. Um, yeah, I think we need to really look after the young ones and give them encouragement. Mm. Yeah, so those would be my needs. Yeah. Well, that's a nice one to finish on because it takes us right back to where we started around around that mentoring and from Ray Broom. Now um, we've sort of finished the kind of conversations, and now we're picking up some questions from the from the audience. So one of them was, um, how has politics influenced the investment in agricultural research? How do you see it? Massively, yeah. massively. Um, it uh, dominates the uh, central government investment. Uh, and even at a sector level, uh, when I'm meaning that, it could be the dairy sector or it could be the um, the livest meat, uh, mixed livestock sector. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, again, the politics of those organisations dominate the investment. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one that really still I find hard and I reflect back on it hard to accept was the denial by our um, sector bodies uh, of um, uh, the environmental impact their farming mm. systems were having. And uh, certainly in the meat and wool area, uh, whenever we were wanting to try to, uh, and again, got on the soapbox, it did yeah. the wrong way. Yeah. Uh, talk about the environment things as if it wasn't leading to production and profit, it didn't matter. Yeah. Um, and uh, so. Uh, but that comes back to your whole thing around making sure you've got environment, social, economic, collectively yes, together. And, and that uh, is in hindsight the balance. Yeah. I would have to admit that starting off, it, I never ever would have been thinking like that. Yeah. That's the, the hindsight of it. Yes. Yeah. Sounds nice. Uh, a question here. Um, how well do current research and practice change structures um, add value to Māori or, or fit for purpose for Māori? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I would say that at the moment, um, when you say research, uh, um, my experience at the moment, the majority of Māori businesses are not seeking new knowledge, not seeking research, they are seeking the development of practices um, that would align with their, um, their vision and their, their goals of mm. them. Uh, and so therefore, uh, we are talking about people who are strong in the development area, uh, in the um, encouragement, support of change. And, and it's a really good question there mm. because the one thing that people need to understand is for most Maori uh, agribusinesses, there are about four levels that need to be in alignment mm. 
to get the change in place. So you'll have governance, a supervisor often, yeah. uh, a farm manager, and farm staff. And, and if any of those four are not in alignment, then change actually is slow or doesn't occur at all. Mm -hmm. So the ability to go out and have conversation and work through and give confidence to all four layers mm. is actually quite important. Mm. And at the moment, we're probably not well catered for in providing that. Mm. That's a really good answer. Um, we've got scientists and CRIs. What should we be doing more of or less of? What do you reckon? <laughs> You should be doing more. You should actually be reading the literature. Uh, I find uh, in maybe I'm just an old fat. Um, you may say that I can possibly comment. Yeah. But uh, but the amount of times I might go and being reviewing papers and so forth, or looking at new proposals, or looking at programs uh, for new investment. Um, I'm consistently referring people back to the literature of the 70s, 80s and 90s. Mm. So I would like people to actually read more and understand more. Mm. Um, uh, less of was the other part of the question. Oh man, it's not their fault, but I mm. wish the CRI researchers did not have to spend so much time in putting proposals together for funding. Mm. And that to me is an unfortunate thing of the environment in which they're working mm. in. Um, and the amount of time and energy and sometimes knocking of confidence yeah. uh, through that type of current approach we have. Mm. Yeah. Um, I've got two more questions and then I think we're going to close up. Um, do you think there's any genuine systems research actually happening? Oh, and if there is, where? Mm. Uh, yeah, really good question. I would feel in the, the um, yeah, I'm dithering. Well, it's me that desires, <laughs> not you. I'm dithering. Um, the kiwi fruit industry, I think, have gone about the business of doing good systems research mm -hmm. and um, and driving, if you like, a lot of the practices back on far on the orchard, um, based on the marketing mm -hmm. side of things. Um, but it's really quite interesting. At the moment, I'm struggling to be able to say that sitting in the uh, CRIs, I'd have to go back to Pasture 21, which I know is an acronym. Mm -hmm. That would be the last kind of collective uh, grouping mm -hmm. and program I see where there was uh, systems work being done for both dairy and uh, the mixed livestock sector. Mm -hmm. uh, that now would be four or five years ago. And I'm not familiar that there's been anything that's replaced. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So my last question from the audience, thanks very much everybody for sending the questions in, but and this is one, do you think or does New Zealand have a future in the primary industries given the rise in plant-based foods? Oh, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And that, that would happen to be your question. Now, it did. It? <laughs> It was, I mean, but it wasn't mine. It's come to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I absolutely do because uh, I think that we will uh, still, there will still be a marketplace for um, uh, animal protein, animal products. Uh, there will still be uh, customers wanting those, that they will be asking for those um, products to be produced in a certain way. So, it may be a little bit different than what we currently do. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing too is that um, not all land that we have will be able to be in some kind of plant-based um, kind of, whether it's fibre, in terms mm -hmm. of timber, uh, there will be always some land that we will actually want to have an animal harvesting the biomass mm -hmm. 
and that will be the best land use uh, suited for it. So I do think the combination of land use suitability and market uh, pool, I think mm. that we will definitely have um, great opportunities going forward. I would encourage people uh, to read the uh, primary sector council's report that's just been mm -hmm. made. Uh, there's a very um, strong emphasis on the uh, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, I think that will be something most useful mm -hmm. to read. Really nice positive way to end. This has been a pleasure. It worked. Thanks, right. Gavin. Thank you. My pleasure. So, and thanks to everybody who's participated in this live stream. It's going to be, well, it has been, we hopefully think it's been recorded. And so if you go next week onto the New Zealand Grasslands website, there'll be a link to the web stream so that you can share it with, with friends. And uh, AgriSearch's web, I think if you go on there too, there'll be a link to it. So again, many thanks for everyone for participating. And if there's anyone here at Ruakura, uh, Gavin's going to go down to the campus club now. And I don't know, are you shouting? No. Oh, no, he's not. No. Well, would we expect anything less? So, uh, and again, very um, thank very much the New Zealand Grasslands Trust for the Ray Brougham um, trophy. Thank you, everybody. And to you, Liz, for your uh, input. Much appreciated. Sure.